This year's speaker series highlights the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence and faculty work in core AI technologies. Last week, um, for those of you who weren't here, we spoke to Dr. Jeremy Weinstein, who explores AI at the intersection of policy. And today we'll be hearing from Dr. Marco Pavone, who talk about the intersection of AI and space exploration. We partnered with HI for this series because AI is such a diverse topic and because it will have a deep effect on all of our lives. AI already helps power chatbots, customer service, online shopping. It influences what you see on Netflix when you turn it on and it can check your work for plagiarism. In the future, it could have an impact on everything from self-driving cars to job automation, to who gets a student or home loan and how much. Hi and Summer Session thought it would be interesting to highlight the many ways that artificial intelligence is being explored here at Stanford. And there really is a vast array of ways that that is happening. Today, I am very pleased to introduce Marco Pavoni and his talk, Artificial Intelligence in Space Exploration. Marco is an assistant professor of aeronautics and astronautics at Stanford University, where he's the director of Autonomous Systems Laboratory and co-director of the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. His main research interests are in the development of methodologies for the analysis, design, and control of autonomous systems. From robots to space exploration to self-driving cars and futuristic transportation systems, he's got his fingers in some pretty fascinating pots. Before joining Stanford, Marco was a research technologist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. With that, I will hand things over to Marco himself. Thank you very much for the introduction. Super excited to be here and to talk about the AI and space uh, exploration uh, among my favorite topics. So let me start by sharing my screen. All right, so in this talk, I'm going to discuss how artificial intelligence is going to significantly impact space exploration by using my work with NASA over the years as uh, running examples. In particular, I will mostly focus on how AI is a key enabler in order to make uh, spacecraft and space robots increasingly more autonomous thereby enabling an entirely new generation of space explorers. Toward the end, I will also briefly mention other domains where AI is poised to become a key enabler uh, for the purposes of space uh, exploration. Now, as mentioned in the introduction, at the Stanford, I direct the Autonomous Systems Lab, whose goal is to make robots capable of uh, uh, um, making decisions on their own. In other words, the goal of my lab is to enable the transition from the field of automation to the field of autonomy. By automation, we mean machines, robots that uh, are automated, but they execute uh, very repetitive tasks. So once you specify uh, what a robot should do, the robot is going to do that thing over and over, and there are no surprises once the robot has been designed and deployed. This is very different from the field of autonomy where the robot is by definition uh, deployed in scenarios that cannot be anticipated a priori. So basically the robot needs some level of reasoning in order to deal with scenarios that cannot be anticipated at the design phase. Typical example of uh, autonomy is represented by self-driving cars where obviously you cannot really list all the possible scenarios that a car could encounter when you program the car. And so the car needs to have some level of reasoning to generalize, to go beyond what it was programmed to do by the engineers. Now, the field of robot autonomy is booming in terms of applications. Self-driving cars is one of the applications that is most typically discussed in the media, but the, there are many other applications from uh, robots for the delivery of groceries, 
all the way to unmanned aerial vehicles, both for urban air mobility or for the delivery of uh, packets and goods, all the way to surgical robots that in the future might uh, uh, accomplish surgical procedures without the help of a human. But the topic of today is uh, uh, autonomy in space, in particular, what is the role of AI for autonomy in space? In particular, as uh, mentioned during the introduction, before joining Stanford as a faculty in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, I was a research technologist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab in the robotic, uh, robotics section. At JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, I worked on uh, the Mars program and specifically on optimizing the entry, descent, and landing of rovers on the Mars surface. I'm sure or quite sure that most of you are familiar with uh, the series of Mars rovers that have been developed, uh, have been deployed on Mars, including the last one just a few months ago. Now, indeed, Mars missions are increasingly benefiting from the inclusion of uh, AI technologies. The entry, descent, and landing phase is indeed uh, almost completely automated. And several other aspects of Mars missions uh, uh, nowadays uh, leverage uh, AI techniques. But we're going to go into the details uh, later in the talk. Another class of robotic systems I've been working on with NASA is represented by assistive uh, free flyers. Assistive free flyers are robots that uh, free float in absence of gravity. For example, inside the International Space Station, there, the goal will be to use uh, assistive free flyers uh, on tasks that uh, are important, but uh, uh, could be accomplished by robots as opposed to astronauts, such as uh, the trimming a tool or unpacking cargo and so on and so forth. The time of an astronaut is extremely valuable if you think how costly it is to uh, send an astronaut to space. So we want to relieve astronauts from the most, uh, uh, you know, trivial day-to-day -day tasks so that they can really focus on what uh, um, really deserves NASA attention. And of course, free flyers can also be used beyond the um, international, uh, beyond applications within the International Space Station, for example, in the context of helping astronauts uh, with uh, extravehicular activities, uh, servicing and uh, repairing spacecraft, there is an entire field called on-orbit servicing by robotic systems that uh, holds a lot of promise, uh, removing debris, and so on and so forth. Specifically, uh, in collaboration with NASA Ames, which is another NASA center and another group at Stanford led by Mark Kutkowski, I've been working on uh, AI-based planning and control techniques to grasp and manipulate objects in space. The difficulty of manipulating an object in space is that uh, objects are free floating, so if you're not very careful when you grasp the object, then you impact on the object and the object might drift away. It might become very difficult to regrasp uh, in the future. So here I'm showing a test uh, performed at uh, NASA Ames of our prototypes, where zero gravity is uh, emulated, emulated by using air bearings of a, on a very flat granite table. The arm of the blue robot, which is the prototype of the free fire, is uh, equipped with the gecko-inspired grippers that I'm showing on the right. This is, these are grippers equip, equipped with the pads that by exploiting directionally aligned micro features become adhesives when loaded in shear stress. And in, that, in this way, they really mimic the properties of uh, geckos uh, and especially their feet. A flight qualified version of these clippers, uh, along with uh, the control algorithm, has been sent to the International Space Station in 2019 and has been tested very recently, actually last month, in space. So here you can see our prototype that is attached to one of the walls of the International Space Station. This is one of the astronauts that is inspecting how well the robot. Uh, has been capable of attaching itself to uh, a wall. So actually one of the astronauts was from Stanford. So you can see that the astronaut is wearing, uh, is probably wearing a Stanford uh, shirt. But the focus of this talk is going to be on the design of novel robotic platforms 
for the in situ surface exploration of a small solar system bodies, such as asteroids, comets, uh, and Martian moons. This is a very good example of how AI is a key enabler for several capabilities within the autonomy stack of an autonomous robot. So basically to enable the autonomous brain of a robot, if you will. Um, first of all, why do we want to go to small bodies? Typically when we talk about the solar system, we think about uh, the sun, the planets, but actually the solar system is plenty of uh, very small bodies that uh, in the past 10 years have become a primary target of space exploration. How small is small? Well, it, there is actually a huge variety of small bodies. They go from a very tiny one, like an asteroid Itokawa, with a diameter of 300 meters, to some uh, to Phobos, which is a Mars moon, with a, a diameter of uh, 22 kilometers. But we're talking about very tiny bodies as, with as, as compared to planets. So why they're interesting for exploration? Well, it turns out that uh, understanding uh, the chemical and physical properties would shed light on the evolution of the solar system on its origin. And also small bodies have become a primary targets from an astrobiolo astrobiological standpoint. So some of them might actually potentially harbor some forms of life. And this, this has rushed a number of hypotheses such as myself in the task, uh, uh, on the task of developing robotic platforms to uh, explore them. Now, in these bodies, weak, the bodies are very small, so the gravity on them is extremely small. In particular, weak gravitational fields in the order of micro G to milli G make the adoption of traditional mobility systems difficult. For example, wheeled vehicles, so vehicles with wheels such as Mars rovers, are bound to extremely low speeds, less than one millimeter per second, so almost like a snail pace, due to the very low traction. There is low gravity, thus there is low traction, and then the wheels will spin in place. On the other hand, weak gravitational fields make hopping a particular advantage, advantageous type of mobility. And indeed, many hypotheses, including myself, have been exploring hopping as the preferred mobility option on a small solar system bodies. Of course, uh, the fact that you can leverage a weak gravitational field with the small bodies has been recognized by astronauts as well. So here you can see some astronauts uh, hopping and having fun on the surface of the moon. But you see that here, one of the astronauts actually fell. And indeed, control hopping as required for targeted surface exploration is a, a challenge, as demonstrated, for example, by this astronaut's calling. And this is exactly what uh, I started investigating when I was still back at JPL 10 years ago with uh, some of my colleagues, such as Istan Esnas and, ours, and others. In particular, our project investigated a new rob robotic mobility platform referred to as a hedgehog as a hedgehog due to, the, to its spiky exterior, specifically designed for controlled hopping mobility microgravity. Control here is the keyword. Hopping in low gravity is easy. Do it so in a controlled way is very hard. And we'll see later where AI uh, plays a major role in enabling the control aspect of hopping. The actuation of the hedgehog, the platform that we have designed, relies on spinning three internal flywheels which allows all subsystems to be packaged in a, a one sealed enclosure and enables the platform to be minimalistic, thereby reducing the cost uh, of, the, uh, of the mission. Now, the hedgehogs will be deployed uh, from a Madras spacecraft, which would act as a communication relay to Earth and would aid the in-situ assets, so the uh, robotic platforms, with tasks such as localization and, and uh, navigation. And we're going to go into the details later. To appreciate a little bit more how the mobility system worked, here I'm showing you a prototype that we tested on Earth. And specifically the key mobility concept for the hedgehog is that by applying an internal torque on the flywheels via motors and the mechanical brakes, the chassis rotates and uh, induces external reaction forces on the surface, producing ballistic hops or tumbles. On Earth, uh, gravity is much stronger than on small solar system bodies, so we do not see hops 
we only see tumbles. And here is a video about uh, what uh, I've just described. We spin up the flywheel, then we decelerate it very quickly. We transfer the momentum to the chassis, and these uh, in turn generates the reaction forces that uh, cause a tumble for the platform. This was on Earth on a small body. This tumble would actually be in a hop of uh, several meters. Now, for this platform, we develop the full autonomy stack. So, what is the brain of an autonomous robot? How does it look like? Well, the autonomy stack uh, of an autonomous robot, so the um, uh, you know, set of software that uh, is used to automate the robot, uh, is typically modularized. And the three main modules uh, correspond to the three main functions needed in order to uh, uh, operate uh, in the real world, specifically understanding dynamics, how the robot moves around given some actuated controls, how, where we are, and then uh, given a notion of where we are, how to plan at a high level what to do next, what type of behaviors we want to enable. Specifically, dynamics refers to the notion of uh, understanding how actions influence future states, Localization, as I said, uh, uh, entails the notion of estimating the rover positions on the surface and possibly building a map of the surface uh, of the planetary body. A planning entails choosing good actions given a set of mission objectives. Each one of these three core capabilities is critically enabled by AI, as we're going to discuss. And also would like to point out that, that these are also the key capabilities that you would find, for example, on a self-driving car. The constraints for a self-driving car, of course, are very uh, different. Uh, for example, a self-driving car has to deal with uh, other humans on the road. So you have to reason about interactions with pedestrians, bikers, which is a key challenge. Uh, we don't have that uh, uh, challenge in space. But on the other hand, space has its own uh, uh, challenges, including um, the fact that you are, in general, you move in, on surfaces uh, that are plenty of uh, rocks and uh, very difficult to navigate, very unstructured, and so on and so forth. Actually, right now, I'm in a partial leave of absence at uh, NVIDIA to direct the, um, uh, the autonomous vehicle research at uh, NVIDIA. But this is a separate topic. Today, we're going to focus on uh, space. So let's go through each one of these components, dynamic localization and planning. Let's see a little bit better what they are and what they entail. We're going to describe those from the perspective of a hopping robots, but what they say in general applies to any autonomous robot, in particular in the context of space exploration. And we're going to see where AI plays a key role in each one of them. Let's start with the dynamics. Over the years, we have used a variety of uh, uh, analytical and uh, numerical models to enable, to, to design and enable key motion primitives that uh, allow us to um, control the hopping behavior of the hedgehog robot. For example, uh, motion primitives that uh, allow the robot to hop or to tumble or to just shuffle in place in order to, in order to reorient the platform, for example, to orient the instruments it take, for example, a photo of a given um, scientific target. Now, these are all good, but how do you test uh, such a control motion primitives? This is a challenge because on Earth, we have Earth gravity, but in order to have uh, tests of these capabilities, we have to somehow emulate a very low gravity of small solar system bodies. Turns out that this is very difficult. Um, one approach is to scale up uh, the design to Earth gravity. But for the case of a hopping robot, that is very difficult. The gravity is so high that it's very difficult to replicate the hopping behavior that uh, you will have on, uh, um, uh, on a small body. And this is also true for, our, for other space robots. It's typically very difficult to test them on Earth gravity. Uh, we do have actually a prototype that we tested in Earth gravity that you see here that is tumbling around on the beach of uh, Huffington Bay. But as I said, not happening. So the other approach is to build a gravity of loading test beds. So basically remove gravity somehow from the environment in order to replicate what you will have 
on a reduced gravity body. You could, for example, you could test a robot in a, in a tank, uh, and so leveraging buoyancy to replicate uh, almost a zero gravity environment. But of course, uh, in water, now you have to reason about uh, um, hydrodynamic effects that uh, uh, you would not have in a small body. So actually, buoyancy tanks have its own challenges. We have already seen air bearing platforms, but typically they only allow you to test a two dimensional motion as opposed to three dimensional motion. We actually built a unique, uh, I would say, in the world, tethered offloading testbed to test a very uh, dynamics in a very low gravity conditions. And the testbed basically comprises a, a gantry system, which we actuate in the X, Y, Z directions, specifically. In the Z direction, we offload almost all of the gravity, and we just leave a little bit, which is the gravity level that you will find in a small body. The platform is enclosed in a gimbal system that allows the robot to freely rotate. So we also have the three rotational degrees of freedom. As um, so the robot, and in particular the gimbal system within which the robot is mounted, is attached to the gantry through uh, a small rod. Uh, so it basically holds almost like a pendulum. As it moves around, uh, you create a, basically a pendulum motion because now you create an offset between the point of attachment on the robot and the point of attachment on the gantry. These are exogenous dynamics, are not dynamics that you would see on uh, a small body. So what you do is to actuate uh, the head of the gantry system to make sure that the head of the gantry system, so the black box that you see on top, is always aligned with the, the, the robot, so that basically you minimize this pendulum dynamics, and thereby you really emulate the um, conditions that you have on a small body. So here I'm showing you some videos from the testbed that we have created, and actually we have in my lab at uh, Stanford. You see that now we see um, hopping motion because we have uh, removed almost all of the gravities through this test. Bed. This is nice, but while we emulate the low gravity dynamics for the robot, we do not really emulate the dynamics for the soil, for the terrain. Actually, the terrain in low gravity conditions behave in a way that is very much different from the way terrain um, behaves in earth gravity conditions, for example, in terms of cohesion. So if you want to really have a high fidelity test, then you have to do something else. Something else might look like a drop towers, parabolic flights, or going all the way to the International Space Station that is in general too costly. Of these parabolic flights is a very good uh, uh, experimental apparatus. So basically the idea here is that you have an aircraft that pitches up for a few thousands of meters, and then it plunges, basically it goes in free fall, uh, for a few uh, thousands of meters, typically from about 6,000 meters to 3,000 meters. As the airplane is falling, inside the cabin, you have, uh, the, uh, uh, you have basically a zero gravity environment because you're falling with the aircraft. So think about an uh, elevator that is falling, but now you're an aircraft and you're falling for thousands of uh, um, uh, meters. So, what this buys you is a microgravity condition for about 20 to 25 seconds. That's great. So that's what we did. So we brought our robot on a parabolic flight. We built a test apparatus where the robot, you can see it on the right, the schematic, the robot is inside a, a, a box and uh, it's tracked by a number of cameras. And as soon as the um, aircraft is plunging, we um, actuated some of the motion primitives that I discussed before, and we evaluate their performance. On the left-hand side, you can see the real thing. So I am the one on the right that is uh, manipulating the robot and uh, checking the robot as it performs its uh, maneuver. It's a pretty uh, exciting uh, ride. Um, at the beginning, it's a little bit uh, challenging because, of course, you know, free falling for a uh, uh, 30 seconds uh, uh, creates a little bit of uh, nausea and so on, but then you get the uh, hang of it and then it, it's pretty fun. Um, so we tested the robots on a number of different surfaces from high friction surfaces to 
um, simulant of a regolith all the way to sandy surfaces. And here I show you some of the videos that we recorded. And these are in gravity conditions that are very similar to the ones that you would have on a small body. These are all videos from uh, the parabolic flights. These are videos on sand. So here we wanted to understand how the different motion primitives uh, um, perform given different uh, surfaces. The reality is that when we send a robot to an asteroid or to a comet, another small body, we don't really know what surface, surface we want, we're going to encounter. So we really need to develop a robot that is capable of moving effectively on the vast class of possible surfaces. Here I'm showing a maneuver that is meant at uh, getting the robot a stuck from the scent by performing this kind of tornado-like um, uh, course crew uh, maneuver that ejects the robot uh, yeah, on the vertical axis. Okay, so where does AI uh, enters the picture here? Well, as you can imagine, and let me show the, oh, sorry. Let me show this video again. As you can imagine, modeling the dynamics, the uh, spike to terrain uh, interaction dynamics by using uh, mathematical models uh, is uh, almost impossible. So here AI, and in general, where AI is extremely useful from a dynamic standpoint, is in building data-driven models that allow us to map control actions, in our case, uh, uh, accelerating and decelerating the flywheels or um, you know, actuating the wheels for wheeled robot and so on. So relating that with the future motion of the robot. So you can model that with a neural network or some other data-driven technique. But in general, this is an area where AI is a key enabler. Very difficult to do it with traditional methods. AI is actually suited to model well the extremely complex dynamics that you will have when a robot uh, dynamically interacts with the surface, either for hopping or for tumbling or for rolling and so on and so forth. Um, actually, for these experiments that uh, I just showed, they were first of their kind. They were probably the first set of experiments that really tested the microgravity mobility at this level of accuracy. So we got a lot of press. Uh, and here you can see the former NASA administrator, Charles Bolden, holding one of the prototypes uh, in the Congress. Uh, I'm on the left, and uh, one of my PhD students is on the right, uh, Ben Hockman, who is now at JPL. Now we'll talk about dynamics, and we talked a little bit about how AI is really helpful in uh, modeling uh, the dynamics of space robots. Let's go to the next uh, uh, key capability from autonomous robot, which is the capability of localizing uh, uh, its uh, of, um, sorry, of localizing itself on the surface, understanding where it is, and possibly building a map of the environment. So in our work, uh, we consider a two-pronged uh, approach. The uh, first component is aimed at uh, providing global localization. By global localization, I mean the task of uh, uh, understanding where the robot is uh, over the surface of uh, the small body. We have no clue where we are. We want to understand with a reasonable accuracy, maybe not centimeter level, but at least at a, uh, uh, at a high level, where we are. So for that, um, we introduce another technologies that allows to allow us to constrain the location on the surface by precisely measure, measuring the local gravity vector, a specific leveraging the fusion of a star tracker and an accelerometer. So the idea is that uh, you know on a large body like a planet, these bodies tend to be spherical in their shape. So gravity is more or less the same everywhere. But small bodies have highly irregular shapes, like the peanut type of shapes. Since the shape is so irregular, actually the gravity vector is very different depending on where you are. So basically, if you can measure that gravity vector and you have a gravity model of the, of the small body that tells you which gravity vector should have, you should have more or less in each location, you can correlate the two, and then you can have a, a localization estimate. Now, this is typically good in order to estimate where you are 
with uh, um, decent accuracy, but not perfect accuracy. So you can be localized up to say 10 meters or 20 meters. So in order to really localize yourself uh, with very high um, accuracy and precision, we developed a complementary localization pipeline that entails a collaborative vision-based SLAM approach. SLAM stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. One of the key difficulties in uh, localizing yourself in uh, unexplored environments is that uh, you want to localize yourself with respect to a map, but you don't have a map. So as you localize yourself, you want to get that map. So it's a sort of a chicken and egg problem. If you have the map, you can localize yourself. Uh, but if you don't have the map, how you localize yourself? Well, there are these uh, algorithms, uh, many of them based on AI, that allow you to solve this uh, slum problem effectively. And specifically, in our context, we tailored the slum algorithms uh, by developing a two phase approach. In the first phase, um, the, uh, the mothership that orbits around the small bodies, small, small body, maps the surface of the body by capturing images from various poses and illumination angles. And these images are processed to create a prior map of uh, three dimensional landmarks. In the second phase, which is when we de deploy the hopping robot uh, on the surface, um, the robot, uh, the, the rover uses a camera to relocalize itself with respect to the prior map and to perform onboard uh, vision based simultaneous localization and mapping. What I showed you in uh, the video are uh, tests from um, uh, a simulation test bed at NASA JPL, where uh, there is a shape of uh, an asteroid, and then we recreated the same illumination conditions that uh, you will have on an asteroid. The green dots are the landmarks as computed by the mothership. And then what you see are basically the hopping motion of the uh, robot. And on the right hand side, you can see how the trajectories are reconstructed on board by the uh, rover. So that it knows exactly what is, in go what is going and uh, what type of trajectory it has followed. Uh, Perception localization is another uh, functionality in the autonomy stack that leverages uh, massively AI techniques. For example, most of uh, the tools today to detect objects, uh, track objects, and so on, are all based on AI. Uh, they're all neural networks. Uh, for example, in the, in the context of self-driving cars, it's all neural net based. And this has been like a, a you know inflection point in terms of uh, capabilities uh, and a completely paradigm shift in how you architect a robot in the past uh, uh, seven to ten years. Um, finally, uh, the third module is the module of planning. The module of planning entails choosing good actions given a set of mission objectives. Planning is basically the model that is in, in charge of making good decisions, uh, safe decisions, by concatenating motion primitives. Now, in the case of a hopping robot, this is a very complicated problem. So basically, you are in a, some initial condition. You want to get to some target uh, to carry out some scientific uh, investigation. And, you want to decide how to do that best. Should you hop in one direction and another direction? How many hops should you leverage the rebound from a rock and so on and so forth? Uh, you have been able to localize yourself by using your algorithm. You know more or less uh, what dynamics you will have uh, once you rebound from rocks and so on, but still there are many possibilities. So what is the best uh, sequence of actions? That's very tough. Uh, think of it as uh, playing golf. So basically, what you have control of when with the hopping robot, uh, hopping robot such as the hedgehog is the initial hopping angle. So um, uh, with what angle and what speed that you start hopping, similar to golf when you impact the ball. But different from golf, here we are playing, if you will, on a, a surface that is extremely regular, full of rocks, boulders, uh, on a very weird gravitational field, sometimes, uh, because of the shape of the object, the gravitational vector goes upward. So actually, you are pulled away from uh, the object. And on top of it, uh, typically, these things spin very quickly. 
So just to give an idea of how complex that is. Well, uh, decision-making is yet another module that I highly benefit from AI techniques, specifically for the context of the helping robots. We have been using reinforcement learning algorithms, which is a specific class of AI algorithms to allow robots, so here I'm showing simulations, to plan the trajectories that through different rebounds allow you to get the target destination, the red one over here. Uh, so key message here is that uh, AI is really a key enabler for autonomous spacecraft and space robots because it's basically an overarching cross-cutting technologies, uh, technology underpinning all the main functionalities of an autonomous robot from uh, uh, perception to decision-making to uh, dynamics modeling and so on and so forth. Of course, some of these functionalities could also be developed uh, without AI techniques, but typically uh, you will have uh, less um, uh, performance and basically you will not be able to do all the things that you could do with AI enabled robot. That said, even though I spoke about uh, uh, AI for space exploration in a specific context of uh, robot autonomy, certainly robot autonomy is not the only application domain of AI when it comes to space exploration. How is AI used in space exploration beyond robot autonomy? In many, many different uh, ways. One of them, and actually this is the probably first use of AI in space exploration that which dates back to say 20 years ago is in analyzing massive amounts of observation data. All the spacecraft that now we have in the solar system, all the observatories, observatories and so on, they generate a huge amount of data to a point that has become impossible to uh, analyze all this data with the traditional tools. That's where AI really shines first and foremost, analyzing massive amount of data. In particular, on the right-hand side, I'm showing you uh, on the right side, the uh, orbits of the Earth planets, and on the left side of this figure, the orbits of the planets in another planetary system referred to as Kepler-90. So here the point is that uh, in 2017, NASA jointly with Google announced the discovery on eighth planet, uh, in the Kepler-90 system. And this is important for two reasons. One, this discovery was made using uh, machine learning uh, methods developed by Google. But second of all, the discovery of this eighth planet showed for the first time a solar, uh, sorry, a planetary system that is uh, the one of Kepler-90 that is very similar to the solar system. Indeed, they have the same number of planets. Uh, Kepler-90 was the first um, system that uh, is tied in terms of number of planets with the number of planets of the solar system. And this uh, discovery was actually enabled by AI. Of course, AI can help with optimizing mission design, but all the way to other aspects that might be less uh, um, expected uh, uh, at first glance, like for example, enhancing space communication. Uh, the idea of cognitive radios, radios that basically allow to, radios that uh, optimize their settings depending on environmental conditions without any inputs from human. This is of paramount performance. Uh, you are in a very remote, in a very remote environment on some planetary bodies very, very far away that is rotating and you have a weird environmental conditions and so on. You can't really rely on a human to, uh, optimize the settings uh, um, constantly. Primarily, you have a, a delay in terms of communication. And two, you might even lose communication with your brother. So having radios that automatically uh, understand what is the best way to communicate to Earth is uh, of paramount importance. And cognitive radios, for example, is another, I think, a wonderful application of AI in the context of space exploration. That's all great. Are all problems solved? Absolutely not. Still, AI is not as pervasive in uh, space exploration as one would uh, hope for. One of the reasons is that, uh, uh, as many of you may really be familiar with, AI, even though it's extremely powerful, sometimes uh, might make uh, mistakes. And some of those mistakes will really be counterintuitive and very surprising to, to us. Here I'm just showing 
well-known example of uh, uh, how easy it is to trick even state-of-the-art uh, computer vision network in charge of recognizing the traffic signals. So here you see a stop signal where people have put a few stickers in some strategic places, and this stop signal is recognized as a speed limit. So you can think about how disastrous this will be from a set driving car uh, standpoint. So the point here is that uh, still there are uh, situations whereby an AI-based uh, um, solution might be full. So there is a lot of research right now on how to make this AI system increasingly more robust and trustworthy in order to enable safety critical applications such as a space exploration. Why is space exploration safety critical? Of course, if a spacecraft uh, uh, malfunctions, nobody dies. Uh, well, of course, unless there are astronauts. But, um, but the problem is that uh, it takes, it costs a lot of money to develop a spacecraft. So you really, can, you really want to minimize uh, the probability that uh, there is a malfunction. So what, that's why there is uh, so much emphasis on trusted AI technologies. And there is still a gap, and that's one of the reasons why AI still is not as pervasive as one would hope for. There are also other reasons that are related to the available availability of a compute uh, on a spacecraft, but this is probably one of the main ones. In this context, and this will be one of the, my last slides, uh, I have set up uh, a, a center sponsored by NASA on safe AI and robust AI for aerospace systems, but we are investigating uh, new AI algorithms that are uh, trusted, meaning that they are robust by design, and at the same time, algorithms that uh, keep AI in check, that constantly monitors that your, constantly monitor that your neural networks, for example, are uh, behaving normally, they don't have malfunctions, and if they have a malfunction, you have monitors that raise an anomaly signal and inform downstream decision. So a lot of opportunities here, both in terms of contributing to the space, to space exploration, contribute to AI theory, particularly in the context of trustworthy AI, and of course, contributing on the intersection between these two technologies. If you are interested in AI, space exploration, and you are at the Stanford, I encourage you to get involved with the Stanford Student Space Initiative. This is a student group that I founded soon after I joined Stanford in uh, 2012. And uh, my idea was to have a small group of about 20, 30 people uh, to you know, do some cool space-related projects with them. And uh, to my surprise, this group has now grown to the largest uh, student-run group at uh, Stanford. Now it comprises about 250 students working on several different topics from a high altitude balloons to rockets to satellites to uh, astrobiology to in situ resource utilization and so on and so forth. Uh, the group has a world record on a number of uh, different uh, uh, tasks such as uh, endurance for high altitude balloons. So I think this is a very great, you know, it's a great opportunity to get uh, engage in, in these topics if you happen to be uh, a center. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that uh, you might have. And if you don't have uh, a chance to get an answer to your question today, feel free to email me. Thank you so much, Marco. It's great to hear from you. And I think we learned a lot today about what is possible with space exploration. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the chat back on now so all of you can make comments, show your gratitude for the speaker, but please remember that if you have a question to submit it to the Zoom Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, so the chat is for saying hi, and then the Q&A portion is for submitting your questions to be answered on the spot. So we'll now begin the 15 minute Q&A. Um, again, you can raise your hand or submit a question. And if you raise your hand, we'll just unmute you and you can answer live. But I'll just go ahead and kick us off with the first question in our bank. Um, this question says, could you please describe an example of space automation tasks that were handled prior to AI and how that same task can be handled by incorporating AI so that we can just compare the two and better understand how AI is being used? Yeah, I think this is a great question. Uh, 
one example that is not related to automation, but really AI provided uh, uh, a key advantage is the task of uh, um, analyzing massive data sets uh, from different types of uh, orbiters or instruments. Um, so this is a key application. In the context of automation, probably one of the key examples that is represented by perception. You can do uh, perception with the more classical methods that are not used by data-driven techniques, but actually you can show through quantitative measurements that you have much better performance by using uh, uh, AI uh, techniques. So perception is probably uh, a good example. Uh, some aspects of uh, decision making also, even though decision making yet is not uh, um, it's still quite classical that is you know in uh, space uh, uh, missions that have been accomplished to date primarily because it is the concern of a trusted ai as i said i would say perception is a very good example of uh, uh, task and automation that really benefited from ai both in space and non space applications thanks for that and our next question actually refers to something from um within the presentation um it was a question about the diameters of the small bodies you mentioned um you said that it was only 320 meters in diameter but it resembled the shape similar to a beam is that diameter maximum diameter or is that shape more or less average yeah so one way of measuring it for example is to take a the maximum distance between uh, any two points on uh, on the body, and it's right in measuring the small bodies is a little bit more ambiguous because they don't have the spherical shape. So reasoning just about a radius wouldn't make sense anymore. So basically, you, for example, consider the maximum distance between any two points on the surface. And this is more of a personal question, but what inspired you to work at NASA in the fields of autonomous robotics and AI? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, I've always been fascinated by exploration, specifically space exploration. I don't have a, a good answer about that. I've just been fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm generally fascinated by um, uh, unknown words, if you will. So for example, I love space exploration and I love uh, underwater. Uh, for example, scuba diving is uh, another one, is one of my favorite uh, hobbies going down and exploring caves and so on. So that's for space. And for automation, I always enjoyed the, the uh, intellectual challenge of uh, controlling nature, if you will. Nature doesn't like to be controlled, even though we have all these beautiful examples of uh, rovers going to Mars, uh, cars running around and so on. There is so much work in order to make those things work because there are so many things that can go wrong. So it's really challenging, but also really gratifying. So on the one hand, there is the passion of exploration. On the other hand, the eagerness of tackling the challenge of controlling nature, if you will. And then I joined the two uh, through the lens of uh, uh, space uh, exploration. And this next question was actually on my mind as well. So I'm gonna ask it. Um, do you think AI could ever be trusted to carry human astronauts into space in the near future? Well, I mean, I would say the hope and the bet that a lot of uh, companies are making is that uh, we should trust AI to use, uh, to control autonomous cars. And, um, and there are examples where we already trust uh, AI for advanced uh, driver assistance systems. So there are already examples where AI is mature enough uh, to be trusted for some automated functionalities on cars. So uh, the topic of then uh, using AI for um, space travel then doesn't seem so far-fetched. Still it requires a lot of work, but it's certainly possible as something that is in our future. Thanks for that. And um, I guess the next question going along the same vein, would AI ever be applicable to space medicine for astronauts? I, it's a really sensitive topic for me in the sense that 
as you know, I'm excited about robotics and excited about automation. So, so for me, space exploration is mostly about robotics. All my work is to remove astronauts from space exploration, which is a bit strange. So that said, um, possibly, I mean, um, of course, uh, we're currently working on sending humans to Mars. Uh, that actually would, you know, is a trip that would take a lot of time. Uh, and so it, it's possible that uh, some of those astro astronauts get sick. On the other hand, I think there are so many other challenges that uh, one needs to care about before actually getting to this topic of space medicine that, I mean, it's not like a top of my list in terms of problems that uh, need to be solved. And what kind of scientific explorations could hopping robots partake in applications? Well, applications, uh, I would say zero. Is, uh, so a hopping robot is literally uh, a sensor that moves. And uh, so the, the information that you, you want to get from a hop, a lot of information can be uh, received by a mothership. You do not need it to have uh, contact uh, with the surface. Indeed, uh, everything that you can do with a mothership, you should do it with a mothership because every time you make contact with the surface, there is a high risk of actually having an accident. Indeed, there are uh, a number of missions to small bodies that have failed uh, for a number of reasons during the deployment phase. For example, a Japanese mission called Hayabusa tried to develop, deploy the rover called uh, Minerva on an asteroid called Itokawa, but the Minerva rover was not captured by the gravitational field of Ito Itokawa, and so it was lost in space. And uh, but as it was getting lost in space, it took the pictures of the mothership, and you see that the mothership becomes smaller and smaller because the rover is uh, getting farther and farther, but still communicating with the mothership. And so there is a paper from uh, the scientist, uh, the principal investigator of the Minerva rover that got lost in space, which says, uh, but of course we didn't have a chance to test the rover, but at least the camera works. So this is a good example of uh, seeing the glass. Uh, you know, half full or half empty. Um, but that said, many measurements can be taken by mothership, but many others need uh, extended contact with the surface, particularly those that uh, mm, uh, are aimed at studying the microstructure of the surface and its chemical and physical uh, microstructural properties. Why are the, with a variety of instruments, which could be a microscope and there are uh, many other ones. Why you want to, in general, get information about those chemical and physical properties? As I said before, first, to better understand the origin and evolution of the solar system. So, for example, in the case of the Martian moons, such as Phobos and uh, Deimos, it's still unclear if those are uh, big pieces of Mars that uh, somehow uh, um, got separated from Mars and now have become satellite of Mars, or maybe they're just asteroids that have been captured at some point by the Mars gravitational pull. And that will be important. So if you can really establish uh, which one of the two cases uh, is the correct one, that turns out will put constraints and will put, uh, would allow us to refine the current model for the origin evolution of the solar system, which, which is referred to as the NIST system, NIST uh, model. Then the other aspect is the one of astrobiology. And uh, the third one is that uh, small bodies are seen as a stepping stone for the exploration of uh, other planets in the solar system by astronauts. So first, before sending a human there, you want to fully characterize the surface, obviously. For all that stuff, you really need to have a very um, granular uh, and accurate information about the surface. That's what a hopping robot, or in general, an in-situ mobility robot is going to deliver to you. Thank you so much. And it's just so, it's such an interesting topic. And I think we could really be here all day talking about this. Um, there's a lot of questions here and I would love to get through them I all. I think there's a very good ahead. one that I would like to answer. Which is, <laughs> what, what is something gonna... on the horizon of space tech that really excites you? Yeah. Well, in my mind, one of the most exciting things that we're going to do in the next uh, decades is the exploration of icy moons. 
So these are small, relatively small bodies. Some of them are not so small, but they're not planets. They consider them satellites or small bodies, which have uh, an icy crust, but uh, beneath the icy crust, it is believed that they harbor an ocean. So you say, who cares? Well, if there is water, then there is, high, there is the lack of the possibility that there are forms of uh, life. And so um, one of the missions that is currently being planned is to explore uh, Europa, uh, but there are also other small bodies such as Enceladus uh, in the Saturn system that might harbor an uh, ocean beneath the icy crust and thus potentially life. So of course, from a technology, technology standpoint, uh, this is extremely challenging because uh, those bodies in the Jupiter system, Saturn system are very far. So first of all, you have to get there. It takes a lot of time. It's challenging. Once you get there, you need to penetrate the icy surface in order to get it down to the ocean. And this icy surface is not going to be, it's not going to be, it's not going to be thin. It's going to be very thick. So you have to penetrate uh, uh, tens, hundreds of meters. Who knows? You don't know. And once you get into the water, you have to sample it, and maybe you want to roam around. So, but it might really uh, host, uh, um, you know, wonderful discoveries from a scientific scientific standpoint. And also from a technology standpoint, it's like a robotic stream. It uh, puts everything together: space exploration, uh, dreaming, and uh, underwater exploration, and so on and so forth. So. Icy bodies is really what excites me. Well, as Patricia said, Marco, this is such a fascinating, juicy topic. We could seriously be here all day. And I know there are some questions that we can get to. Um, thank you for geeking out with us. My synapses are firing like crazy. And I'm sure that that's true of others here. Um, these are fascinating topics. The brains of autonomous robots, even without gravity involved, would be a complex thing to contemplate. And I know tonight I'm going to be dreaming of hedgehog rovers and icy moons. So thank you for that. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us um, and thank Marco for being here again. We really appreciate it. Um, and I want to remind everyone that this was the second of three talks that we're having with faculty members about AI. Our next talk is on Tuesday, July 6th at noon with Dr. Michelle Elam. We'll be giving a very different kind of talk on artificial intelligence, activism, and art, which I'm excited to hear as well. You can register on our website, and I believe someone's going to drop the link for that in the chat. And you can also always find those links in the newsletter. So with that, I want to thank you again and um, really appreciate you being here and hope that you all have a wonderful day.